Hey there YouTube, Travis here. So tonight I thought I'd talk a little bit about the things that I do to get a bike running when it's been sitting for a very long time. I know people will buy a bike off of Craigslist and whatnot and it's been sitting for years and it's not obvious what you should do first. So hopefully that will clear that up. I'd like to make a point in saying though that this is not necessarily the things I do before I ride the moped. Uh, I'm not going to go over safety stuff in this video. Uh, this is just more on the mechanical side. Also, this isn't really going to apply so much to modified bikes, um, just stock bikes that have been sitting for a long time. You start getting into things like jetting and timing. So this video is just going to be about the things I do to get the moped going. Because I know the first start videos are really popular and this might you know, give you a little bit of an insight to what goes on behind the scenes. Okay, we'll get this bike wheeled out here in the open where we can really take a look at it. Okay, so it's worth mentioning, uh, the only thing I've done to this bike since I picked it up is I had to angle grind the chain off just because it was one frozen piece. So as I go through, I keep a pen and paper next to me and I write down everything that I'm going to have to order for the bike, uh, starting with a new chain. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is check compression. This is going to take a leaf out of Fred's guide where we make sure that we have compression, spark, and our fuel system in good working order. So before we can even begin to talk about compression, first you got to check and see if the engine is free or not. This engine is free. I can rotate it by hand and uh, you can hear it uh, turning over. Now if I was unable to turn this flywheel the motor would be stuck. Now it could just be stuck from sitting and I have a video called uh, how to unseize moped engines so you can check that out and then there I feature both an engine that's been, just been stuck from sitting and an engine that's a little bit more involved. So if it's not stuck from sitting uh, it's possible it could have been hard seized years ago or um, and by hard seized, I mean it was, you know, the engine got so hot that the cylinder and piston locked up. Or it could just be that, you know, water got down in the engine and fouled everything up in there, and you're probably in for a rebuild at that point. So, yep, once your motor is free, we can start seeing how much compression it actually has. Okay, so on compression. Now, I don't always check for compression before I start a bike. Uh, if it's not starting or if it's not running really right, I'll check it. But this is a really good opportunity to check it. So, I'm going to show you two ways. The first is going to be with the thumb test. Then we'll go on to looking at using some tools. So, if you don't have any compression checking tools, what you can do is take your finger or your thumb and you want to cover the spark plug hole. Now. I'm going to be able to talk you guys through it. I'm not going to show you really just because it's only me down here tonight. But you want to cover the spark plug hole, press firmly against it, make sure that it's you're trying to make the best seal that you can. Then you know, then get a friend to try and kick over the bike. If it blows your finger off, then you pass the thumb test. Okay, so here's where it gets a little tricky. If you pass the thumb test, that's great. It doesn't necessarily mean you have enough compression to run though. The, where the thumb test is useful though, is if you fail the thumb test, then you know you probably don't have enough compression. So what else can we do to check for compression? Okay, that is where this comes in. This is one of your generic $20 compression testers you can get from an auto parts store. Um, they'll have different fittings on the end, you just got to find the one that matches the threads on your moped's head and then you're good to go. Here's the deal on these though, uh, I won't get into the science of it in this video, but the short story is that the hose there can sort of act as an extension of the cylinder per se, and what that means is that with this gauge it can read slightly lower than the compression you actually have. But I think it's a useful tool nevertheless, and let's hook it up to this guy and see what we get. The important part of this guy 
It's up top here. It's got this little Schrader valve up here. So we'll go ahead and screw this in. Okay, so now I'm going to kick it over a couple times. Then after kicking over a few times, the needle should stop at what our compression reader is saying. Of course, I had to borrow a chain from one of the Puka Maxis in order to try this out. Okay, so, according to our compression tester, looking at a little bit, maybe 115-ish, right there for compression. Now, the general rule of thumb is that to run well, you're supposed to look at about 120, so I'm pretty okay with this reading, this little release valve right here. There we go. And out it comes. So compression is something that people love to talk about. Uh, for example, with this tester, I've never gotten the Pook High Torque here to read higher than 90 PSI. And this thing starts up well, runs pretty good, and does the 25 miles an hour that it should as a stock 1.5 horsepower model. So anyway, let's say you do your tests what can you do if you have low compression? So one thing you can do is take a look inside your cylinder, look for intensive scoring. Big thing though I think is to look for the cross hatches uh, that should be in there. If you don't, or if there's a little bit of mild scoring in there, it might be time for a cylinder honing. Also in that respect, take a look at your piston rings. Sometimes you can just have plain old wore out piston rings. Especially, so the Pook service manual says every 5,000 miles the rings need to be changed. Of course, I've seen plenty of bikes with higher mileage. They're still rocking their untouched top ends. But, something to consider for your top end, new rings and a hone. Could also potentially have air leaks coming from your engine seals on the bottom end of your case. Or your top end gaskets could be no good. Honestly, in my experience, these are usually okay until you take them apart and try to put your top end back together. Uh, I would either cut new gaskets based on your existing ones or you can be lazy and buy them in a set. That combined with using a torque wrench, even simple $20 one like this from Harper Freight, which is inch pound, is a lot, a lot better than nothing. You definitely don't want to just crank it till it's tight. Now for this Pookie 50 here, I have a video on my channel, How to Rebuild a Pookie 50, which shows the disassembly and reassembly process. Um, in that I talk about cylinder honing towards the end, as well as ring installation, if you're new to that. But uh, that's one walkthrough available to you, of several. Okay, so next we're going to check for spark and talk a little bit about it too. Okay, so your spark plug, just put it inside the spark plug boot like this. Then you're going to want to go ahead and touch it to the head of the cylinder. You're going to want to get it like that. You want to have really a friend should be grabbing it by the rubber part and holding it there, but I'm just one person here tonight, so we'll see if we can get this on camera for you. Go ahead and turn the light on the camera off so you can see it. You want to see a big fat blue spark when we kick this guy over. Like that. Okay, so what can you do if you have no spark? Well, first things to check are the ignition points. So you gotta see here, see how they're opening and closing. Make sure they're opening and closing. You can also clean the ignition points. Okay, so for a brief explanation of cleaning your points, basically you want to use a screwdriver, pry them open, like that. Then you want to stick a piece of fine grit sandpaper in there, let them close, and pull it out. Do that four or five times maybe, then pry it open, blow some compressed air in there. Hopefully that'll get out any debris. I should mention, if you tell any old timers you do that, they'll get a little upset with you. Ideally, you use something called a points file or even a metal fingernail file 
Um, that'll do a better job. I don't own one of those. I'm assuming you don't either. Um, then you hit it with some sort of cleaner. So on the topic of that, you can use carb cleaner. Um, think about it. Difference between carb cleaner and brake cleaner for the most part. Um, carb cleaner on the right there, it might contain a little bit of an oil. and That might leave a small oily residue on your points, which is not ideal. But brake parts cleaner is not allowed to have any kind of uh, oily residue left over. Think about it, it's going on brake parts. So uh, either can work, um, but I use brake cleaner when I clean my points. Then after you do the cleaner, you want to follow through with a very thin strip of paper, pulling it out a few times, and then maybe hitting it once more with the compressed air, just to be safe. Then you can also try cleaning up the outside of the stator and the inside of the flywheel. You can have spark and still not run if you have weak spark or intermittent spark. The fat blue spark is what you want to see here. If your timing is off, that can cause it not to run. Also, depending on your bike, you might have to deal with some weird quirks. For example, on a lot of hook wiring, sometimes the horn is grounded into the ignition circuit. So you might have to take the horn wires out of the horn and cross them together if you have a bad horn. Also, on some three-wire setups, like the three-wire setup on the Sax G3, the brake light is grounded into the ignition circuit. Symptom on this bike right now is when you grab the brake levers, they uh, kill the engine. That can also interfere with your starting. Also, never underestimate the power of swapping in a new spark plug and testing for spark. Uh, this is a Bosch plug, so there's a good chance that this might actually be the original spark plug. You have no idea if it's good or not, so go ahead and grab an NGK or something and uh, test with that as well, just to be sure. Now, of course, we could talk about spark all day. There's so many more things it could be. You could have a bad condenser inside your flywheel. Um, you could have some bad wiring somewhere. Honestly, and the solution for that is to wire up just for spark. And there's wiring guides on the uh, Pook wiring page on the Moped Army Wiki how to do that um, just to get it to run. Okay, so. We have spark, we have compression, I should also mention that uh, we have spark, but it's good enough spark with good enough timing. What next? Okay, so next I'm going to talk a little bit about fuel system, I'm going to go over the gas tank as well as the carburetor down there. Let's take a look at this gas tank here. So probably the biggest enemy you're going to face looking at these gas tanks is rust. Now this one, if you've watched the intro video, you'll know it's pretty bad. Um, first off, I always remove these oil mixing cups. I've had to fish way too many of them out of the gas tank. I always pre-mix in a red gas can somewhere. So as you can see, and I wish YouTube had smell -o vision here, uh, not only is there corrosive rust built up there, but there's still actually some liquid down there. Oh yeah, some vintage gas. So let me put this on just to get rid of this awful odor. Now I've got an old video up here from I think 2011 at least uh, where I de-rusted a gas tank on a Pook Maxi. And I used the sealer product on it after I de-rusted it. My favorite from what I've seen is the POR15 cycle treatment kit. However, I'd like to make a quick point here. And that point is this. So I feel like my philosophy with dealing with gas tanks has evolved a little bit. I'll only reach for the sealer if the gas tank has little pinhole leaks or if it's really, really, really bad um, and I just want it done with. Realistically, on a lot of gas tanks, you can get away with just doing a treatment, then running a good fuel filter, like one with a paper element, and um, regularly running gas through it. And that really is okay. So I'll go ahead and put a table on the screen. Um, like I said, I'll go into this in another video more in depth later, but general rule of thumb I've been doing is the least abrasive method necessary. You'd be surprised with what you can do with salt and vinegar or something like a vapor rust, which is fantastic as a green uh, safe product before you reach for the acids and the tank liners and sealers and that stuff. I'd like to mention though if you choose to just do a treatment and a filter, go on the Moped Army Wiki and read the full extent of the tank de-rusting article. 
Something not to overlook, for example, if you choose to treat with vinegar, is flushing with 90% rubbing alcohol. Reasons for this, it dries really quick, it gets the water out of the tank. Um, if you don't do this, you'll run through your first thing of premix, and it might run for a couple minutes, but then it'll quit on you, and you'll drain some of the gas, and you'll see it's got these little like, splotches in it. Well, that's the water you didn't get out. So if you're choosing to just treat um, with a treatment method and then running a filter, make sure you rinse that with alcohol. So just to get it running, I've got a lawnmower gas tank on the back here. And this comes down here. This is a thicker line. I didn't make this. I think this is a quarter inch. A 3 16 in line stop thing here. Now before I can plug this into the carb, we need to take a look at that carburetor itself. Alright, let's talk carbs. Okay, so on this moped, it's got a great 12 millimeter bing, which we find on a lot of pooks. This also kind of applies to a Delorto 1412, just because it's a single jet carb. Um, three things I want to check. Well, I shouldn't give it a number. There's a couple things we want to check here. I want to make sure the main jet's clear, the bowl is clean, and the float actually works. Beyond that, this should be just enough to get it running. So let's go ahead and take a look. I'd like to mention I do have a brand new throttle cable here uh, to replace this improper one. Wow, we actually got lucky and were able to pull that fuel line off. Most likely, this is going to get replaced. This stuff is hard, not flexible, brittle. Ugh. And we'll also take the air filter off in this case. So a quick note on air filters. Your moped was supposed to have one from the factory and you're using factory jetting, it's probably going to run best with an air filter. You can upgrade to a high flow filter. Um, if you're looking to upgrade, these ones found on the Pintos, Magnums and stuff like that are kind of nice because they break apart and sort of give them a little cleaning. That's kind of nice. If you've got one off of a Pook Maxi like this, you're a little bit less out of luck. You can try spraying stuff down there, get it cleaned out as best you can. Uh, you can buy reproductions of these, but you'll have to hack them a little bit to fit. I have yet to get one that fits right out of the box, but then again we're dealing with moped parts here, so that's kind of the norm. Uh, or you can go to a high flow filter. Um, but you might be surprised, uh, depending where your moped is stored, this might actually be in pretty good shape. Okay, so on these bings. Once again, the biggest two sources of overflowing problems are the float itself, being a 30-year-old piece of wood, but it could still be okay, as well as the float needle in here that's got a rubber tip on the end, which you need to make sure is intact, as well as the place where it seats. There's brass in there. Well, that's intact as well. Be careful when you're cleaning all this. If you'd like to see a detailed exploration of this carb, I have a How to Clean a Bing video, which I'll link. Um, I won't go too, too in-depth with it here, but I will say you also need to make sure your actuator the throttle is moving the slide up and down all the way and if this wasn't completely frozen up push this down and then pull on the throttle and it should come up that'll verify that's all working as we mentioned before inside here here's your atomizer with the main jet still in it I can't see through that can you <laughs> so I'm gonna get this cleaned out I'm not thrilled with this float height either this should be a little bit more um, parallel with the bottom of the bowl but at least this seems to work, so that's good. Um, you can also clean out this banjo uh, fitting right here. Okay, so the carb is about to go back on the bike. Uh, looks still pretty dirty on the outside, but it's pretty clean on the inside. That's where really what I focused on. Got my new throttle cable up there. And uh, I just want to point out, if you're trying to start the bike over and the plug, the spark plug, isn't wet, you're not getting fuel. On this carb, <laughs> everything was clogged up. Banjo inlet was clogged up, as you saw the main jet was completely clogged up um, with dirt and all that other stuff. So, got all those passages cleaned up. Now we're ready to put the carb on and connect our fuel line. So on the subject of fuel line, even though I'm running an external tank, I'd like to talk real quick. I have not been able to find this locally. Um, I buy it off treats. Still, it's probably one of the few generic items I buy from them. Uh, even though the price has gone up, I still buy it. This is Tigon fuel line. Honestly, this stuff, even two, three years later into the game, uh, still remains flexible and workable, unlike the clear fuel line and some other stuff where it gets really hard and you can't reuse it if you have to take it off. Um, I spend the extra money and get the nice stuff. 
Okay, so next is a pretty obvious one. We're going to go ahead and check on the transmission fluid here. So go ahead and get yourself something. This is an old Frisbee, something to catch all the fluid when it comes out. If it's red, it's probably the original Type F uh, that was used on Pookie 50s. If it's black, it's probably some motor oil somebody put in. But let's see what this one's got. Okay, well, there, uh, there isn't any fluid in this one. So whenever I get to a moped like this, I always like to open up and take a look and see what the clutch and all the other parts look like. Okay, so if there is fluid in there and it looks good, um, you can go ahead and just fill with fresh fluid and go from there and see what happens. I'm going to tear into this clutch just because I'm curious. You can follow me along on the journey, or if you don't want to, just feel free. You can skip ahead a couple minutes to where I start adding the fluid. The tutorial will pick up there. Okay. Now it's time for our clutch puller. Ugh. Got all sorts of weird residue in there. I wonder wonder if that's friction material off of this clutch. This one still doesn't look awful, all things considered. It'll clean up. The least I can do, as of right now, is just get this all cleaned up and put back together. But real quick, I also went ahead and disassembled this clutch a little further. Take a look at this bushing. Mm -mm. This thing got really hot. I want to think it's because somebody was riding doubles on this way too often or all the time based on the foot pegs on the back. Maybe if that's all the friction material in there. Plus the fact that, that rear axle was extremely bent. So much so I couldn't even get some of the nuts off. I'm going to have to cut it off eventually. Ugh. Well, just thought I'd share. Man, that thing got hot. Well, that's a little better. There's only so much I can do. I tried to sand down some of those grooves in there. We'll see if I need to get a new clutch bell or not. That's probably about the most I can do for now. One more thing about the clutch stuff, when you're putting it back together, more likely than not, this 30-year-old piece of paper is no longer good. Um, whenever I've reused these red ones, it just leaks right out the bottom. Go ahead and grab yourself some gasket paper and cut yourself a new gasket. Or if you're lazy like me, just go ahead and grab a pre-made one. Okay, so now that all of that's back together, we can go ahead and put in our transmission fluid. As of right now, this bike is destined to be stock, so it's getting Type F. But, in my kitted bikes, I run 1030 synthetic. Probably the only time I'll ever buy Super Tech oil. <laughs> Do you remember to replace that drain plug underneath? So, we're getting to the end of our journey here. Realistically, on a moped like this, simple two-stroke, your two biggest sources of problems are going to be your carburetor, it's going to be dirty, there's going to be a passage block, or you've got dirty ignition points. Those are the two most common problems. Working from there, you can go through the tests outlined in this video and hopefully get somewhere. Now, of course, this isn't an all-inclusive guide. You can have things like a clogged exhaust. The original pipe for this bike is on the bottom, and it is significantly heavier um, than all my other stock pipes lying around, so I've got this one. It's a little bit nicer to throw on here. So of course you can always decarbonize the exhaust, but just because it's a stock Pookie 50 pipe and I've got so many of them lying around, I'll just put the nicer one on. Okay YouTube, there you have it. Those are some of the things I look at and some of the troubleshooting I do whenever I get a bike that's been sitting for a long time like this one. Now if you've got a keen eye, you've probably noticed that as I've been going through this, I've been replacing and fixing certain things. Something might be more obvious than others, but I'll go over everything in a first start video, which should be quite shortly. Alright YouTube, I'll catch you then.